If you plan to study and practice medicine, at some point in time, you'll be required to place a central line. Number of reasons for doing this. Administering fluids and medication, taking blood tests, measuring venous pressure. You get the idea. If you're new to pulmonary anatomy, you may find it surprising to learn that one of the biggest risk factors associated with this procedure is lung collapse. We'll explore this and much more in our discussion of the pleural cavities and lungs. Good day and welcome to this discussion of the pleural cavity. Pretty short video, relatively speaking, which is good because the entire concept can be a little confusing. So let's jump right into the session objectives. First, and most importantly, we're going to look at the boundaries of the pleural cavity and pleural recesses and discuss why they are considered more or less an empty potential space. Second, we'll describe how the architecture of the pleural cavity assists with the mechanics of lung expansion. We'll then finish off with a look at a few clinical conditions related to the pleural cavity and to the compromise of this potential space. So the important question to begin with, what exactly is the pleural cavity? It's a little complex to explain, so bear with me here. To start with, the thoracic cavity is the region located between the thoracic inlet and outlet, which was explained in a previous video. The thoracic cavity can actually be subdivided into three separate regions. The middle section is referred to as the mediastinum. This is the segment that contains the heart and is discussed in a different session. On either side of the mediastinum are the paired pleural cavities which surround the lungs. Notice that I said surround the lungs rather than contain the lungs. Now this distinction will hopefully make a little more sense in a few minutes. Early in embryology, prior to lung development, the pleural cavity is more or less an empty space filled with serous fluid. Each cavity is bordered on all sides by a continuous serous membrane known as pleura. You can think of this as being like an inflated water balloon, with the pleura being the rubber wall defining the balloon. Okay, so how does the lung fit into this arrangement? During embryology, the lung starts off as small buds off the bronchus within the mediastinum that expand out laterally like a growing tree. As they do, they start to push inward into the medial surfaces of the pleural cavity. As they expand into the space, they push into the medial surface of this pleural membrane, which forms a coat over the outer surface of the lungs. This pleural membrane coating the lung will become known as the visceral pleura, while the pleural membrane that is fused to the outer wall of the thorax is referred to as the parietal pleura. Now, remember what I said, the pleural cavity represents the space surrounding the lung, which means that as the lungs expand, the pleural cavity shrinks as the fluid in the space is reabsorbed. At the end of lung development, the parietal and visceral pleural layers are in near direct contact with only a very small amount of serous fluid remaining to separate the two surfaces. Now because of this arrangement, the pleural cavity surrounding the outer surface of the lungs is considered to be more or less a potential space. As we'll see later in this presentation, there are situations in which this potential space can be compromised, which can result in some very serious medical emergencies. Parietal pleura can further be defined based on its location within the thoracic cavity. The majority of the parietal pleura covers the thoracic cage anteriorly, laterally, and posteriorly, and is referred to as costal pleura. The inferior portion of the parietal pleura lines the diaphragm and is thus known as the diaphragmatic pleura. The medial portion of the pleura? Well, that covers the lateral portions of the pericardial sac and is referred to as mediastinal pleura. Superiorly, the pleura covering the apex of the thoracic cavity projects superiorly above the clavicle and is referred to as the cervical pleura. Because of its close association to the clavicle and subclavian vein, this region of parietal pleura is particularly susceptible to penetrating trauma from bone fragments during a clavicular fracture or from needle sticks from an improperly placed central line, as we discussed at the start of the video. We'll discuss the consequences of tears to the parietal pleura lining a little bit later in the video. When we look at the association of the pleural linings, we can see that all portions of the visceral pleura lie in contact with the parietal pleura. 
The same cannot be said for the parietal pleura, though, particularly during expiration. As the lung deflates and recedes within the thoracic cavity, certain regions of the parietal lining fold in and contact one another, similar to the pages of a magazine as it's being closed. These infoldings are referred to as pleural recesses. The costomediastinal recess is found anteriorly, where a portion of the costal pleura overlining the sternum makes contact with the mediastinal pleura. Posterolaterally, the costodiaphragmatic recess forms as the diaphragm rises during expiration, and the peripheral margins make contact with the inferior margins of the costal pleura. This brings us to a discussion of the mechanics of respiration. How exactly does contraction of the diaphragm and other muscles of respiration cause the lungs to inflate? The secret actually lies quite literally between the parietal and visceral pleural linings and can be demonstrated using a pair of glass slides such as I have here. Now I have two dry glass slides which I put together. What you'll notice is they come apart pretty easily and when I move them together not sure how well you can hear that, but there is a certain degree of friction involved. Now watch what happens when I put just a little bit of water on one of the slides. I now put the slides back together. All of a sudden, they don't separate nearly as easily as they did before. And when I move them along each other, well, probably still a little bit of friction, but it's moving much smoother, dead at dead, when it was completely dry. Now, let's look again at the pleural space. Think of the parietal and visceral pleural membranes as representing the glass surfaces, with the serous pleural fluid serving as the water separating the surfaces. We saw in a previous lesson that contraction of the diaphragm draws it inferior, increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity. Because the parietal diaphragmatic pleura adheres to the superior surface of the muscle, it moves with the muscle. Now, think back to the glass slide demonstration. The hydrostatic forces holding the glass surfaces are also seen between the parietal and visceral pleural surfaces, thanks to the presence of this serous fluid. This pulls the inferior surface of the lung downward with the diaphragm. The same thing happens along the thoracic cage, when the accessory respiratory muscles contract to expand the rib cage and the parietal thoracic pleura. As you might expect, there is a certain amount of sliding between the parietal and visceral pleural layers during this expansion and recoil. Again though, just as we saw with the glass plates, the serous fluid within the pleural cavity lubricates the surfaces and minimizes the friction and irritation. Having discussed the pleural cavity and mechanics of breathing, it's a good time to introduce a few important clinical conditions related to this region. Let's start with one you hear about a lot in the field of emergency medicine, a collapsed lung. As we described just a minute ago, lung inflation depends on hydrostatic interactions between the visceral and parietal layers of pleura. During inspiration, expansion of the thoracic cavity and diaphragm generates negative pressure in the pleural cavity that pulls uniformly on the visceral pleura to expand the lung. The mechanics of this interaction are dependent on complete continuity between the parietal and visceral pleural layers. In other words, the pleural space needs to be completely sealed off. Okay, so what happens if the seal is somehow broken? This can occur with puncturing or tearing of the parietal pleura, as is seen in penetrating wounds to the thoracic cage. At the start of the session, we talked about the dangers associated with central line placement. If the needle is inserted too deep, or at too steep of an angle, it may penetrate the apical parietal pleura. Whatever the reason, when this happens, atmospheric air can be pulled into the pleural space through the tear, resulting in a pneumothorax. Alternatively, blood may be able to enter the pleural space from ruptured vessels lying close to the tear. In this case, the condition would be referred to as a hemothorax. Now, whether it's pneumothorax or a hemothorax, the increasing volume of air or blood in the space limits the ability of the lung to expand normally, resulting in what is commonly referred to as a collapsed lung. A collapsed lung can also occur from tearing of the visceral pleura. Mechanical trauma within the lung can lead to the formation of these subpleural air pockets known as pulmonary blebs, and rupturing of these blebs can lead to a partial lung collapse. Treatment of lung collapse involves sealing off the wound, 
to prevent further accumulation of air or blood into the space. If the accumulation is small, then no further intervention is required, as the blood will reabsorb the material in the space over time. If the accumulation is large, a chest tube can be inserted to suction out the material and reflate the collapsed lung. We'll discuss the placement of these tubes in the next segment. As you might guess from the name, pleurisy, or pleuritis, involves inflammation of the pleural membranes, typically as a result of bacterial infection. As we discussed a few minutes ago, the presence of serous fluid in the pleural cavity provides a frictionless surface for subtle movements between the parietal and visceral layers of pleura. With inflammation of the membranes, there is greater friction between parietal and visceral pleura, resulting in what is known as a pleural friction rub. This can be easily identified on auscultation with the stethoscope, as it creates a grating sound similar to the sound of stepping on fresh snow when the patient breathes in and out. In mild cases, the condition will resolve without complications, but in more serious conditions, the inflammation may lead to regions of fusion between parietal and visceral layers. This complication is also commonly seen with chronic exposure to asbestos. Another condition we can introduce at this point is pleural effusion. This describes an increase in the accumulation of serous fluid within the pleural cavity, between the parietal and the visceral pleural layers. It can occur for a variety of reasons, including pleurisy, but is most commonly associated with seepage of interstitial fluid surrounding the alveolar sacs through the visceral pleura into the pleural space. This can happen for a variety of reasons. In the next section, we will discuss the pathophysiology of pneumonia, which leads to the buildup of fluid in the lungs and ultimately in the pleural space. With chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or congestive heart failure, diminished venous return places increased pressure on the pulmonary capillary beds, resulting in pulmonary edema that leads to pleural effusions. Effusion provides a potential medium for opportunistic infections, which can result in the accumulation of pus, a condition known as emphema. A few minutes ago, we discussed the mediastinal and costodiaphragmatic recesses, where parietal pleura folds in upon itself. These recesses represent pockets in which fluid can collect, particularly in the costodiaphragmatic recess when the person is upright or lying in a supine position. This fluid creates a hazy appearance in radiographs, which assists with the identification of these effusions. That's going to do it for our discussion of the pleural space. Coming up after the break, we will look at the organs surrounded by the pleural space. In other words, we'll be taking a look at the lungs. See you then.